This program is recorded and presented by Chippewa Valley Community Television. The audio for this program can be heard on WRFP LP 101.9 FM. Community Television and the Chippewa Valley Sustainable Future Festival presents Beekeeping. Well, welcome everyone to Beekeeping by Ellen Sorensen. Um, this presentation is going to introduce you to some of the issues surrounding beekeeping today, and you'll be able to learn how to produce local honey, um, the pollination role served by honeybees, and the difficulties apiaris face with colony collapse disorder. <laughs> you may have noticed like there's fewer bees around. I know I have in, in my yard, so she's doing a lot to get more bees so the plants can be pollinated. Just a little bit about Ellen. Ellen is a hobby beekeeper and geographer, and her journey with beekeeping began in college when she helped start an apiary on the campus of University of Wisconsin Eau Claire in 2009. And it's actually right across from Phillips and behind the three little houses there where our international visiting scholars live. It's actually in the backyard of Care House, as I've seen it. And I was wondering, like, who did that? Now I know, her, so it's kind of exciting. Um, she's given lectures and countless tours of her bee yard, and um, Ellen has also focused her studies on the effects of geospatial relationships on Wisconsin's hobbyist beekeeper. So let's give a big round of applause for Ellen. Okay. Is this thing on? Am I good to go? Okay. Hooray. Hi. Thank you all for coming. Um, my name is Ellen. Um, right here you're seeing a bunch of carnolian bees. Um, right now, um, in a single beehive, there's between 60,000 and 80,000 bees in a single beehive, something oh. like this, that's going to be over six feet tall. And that's about the population size of Eau Claire in a single beehive. So there's a lot of bees hanging out together and living in this wonderful community. Um, bees are very, very similar to humans, actually, um, in a sense that they all rely and they have their own individual jobs, and they have their individual roles, and everything works as this beautiful society. Um, inside a single beehive, there's going to be one queen, and that single queen is going to be um, kind of in charge of everything, but all the decisions are run by all the workers in the individual hive. And there's going to be 11 different jobs in an individual hive, from uh, nurse bees to mortician bees to forager bees, a um, whole slew of different jobs. Um, and 99% of all the bees inside a single hive are going to be females, and 1% are going to be males. The males don't really do anything. They only really um, roll. <laughs> they really don't. It's, it's an unfortunate thing. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, the, uh, the, the male bees, or drones, uh, their only real role is for reproduction. And right after reproduction, they die instantly. And that's all they do. <laughs> Um, and to make matters worse, at the end of a season, so after the pollination occurs and after all the foraging occurs, when bees go into winter, actually all of the male bees are kicked out of the hive by all the female bees because it's just an extra mouth to feed. So they're deemed as useless and they're kicked out of the hive and it's just the female bees who hang out and take care of the queen and they prepare and they overwinter and then they wake up in the spring and say, hey, this is fantastic. Let's start pollinating and gathering nectar. Um, so that's kind of their role. So what I'm going to do today is talk about the role of beekeepers and kind of talk about the role of pollination and talk about more of the seasonality of beekeeping. Um, when I first got into beekeeping, I really only thought about honey. And I really thought about, oh, this is really fantastic. This is you know, better than sugar, and it tastes so sweet. And I had really little knowledge about how bees live outside all year round. I thought that they magically disappeared, and turns out that bees um, live outside, even in Wisconsin weather. Even when it's frigid and it's really cold, they live outside. And um, a lot of the beekeeper's role is manipulation of bees, and it's really trying to convince the bees to stay in this box. Because the bees don't need people, people need the bees. Um, so it's not like taking care of a dog that's going to be your best friend and follow you around. Um, the bees could care less who's taking care of them, um, and they're perfectly fine out in nature. Um, so really, um, all the beekeepers are doing is they're trying to create the most perfect environment for bees to stay in this individual box. So whether that's making sure this box is ventilated, making sure that this box has enough 
um, heat, making sure it has enough food. Um, because what the beekeepers are doing is all the honey that you consume, and I have tons of wonderful honey that I hope everyone can come up and try, different types of samples. Um, all of this honey is the bee surplus honey that they use to get through the winter. So the beekeepers are actually taking away their winter storage. So a lot of the manipulation that the beekeepers are going to do is going to make sure that the bees survive throughout the winter. So, and I have this really fantastic website that I want to show you. I'll, um, let's see if I can do this correctly. Oh, that's not, okay, we're back again. Let's not do that. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry about that. So this website I have here um, has been a work in pro progress. Um, this has been an extension of some undergraduate research. Can everyone see if I stand over here? Um, it's been an extension of some undergraduate research um, I was helping to conduct. Um, looking at um, pollinators and looking at where are honeybees and where do they exist. I hear all these wonderful stories about all these beekeepers, but I had absolutely no idea where these beekeepers were living. And I was hearing all these stories about how these bees are dying in these far off places like Florida or California, but I wasn't really hearing of any bees who were dying in Wisconsin. So I wanted to see where are beekeepers in Wisconsin and what are they doing? What is their story a little bit? How much honey are they producing? Are they losing their bees over the winter? Are they not losing their bees? Um, so, my last year of school, I um, conducted some research that I will show you some fantastic maps that kind of look at the geospatial relationship and the human environmental interaction between bees and their environment. But in the meantime, I'm going to show you some really cool photos that I'm really excited about um, that talks a lot about more the seasonality and how you get started with a hive. So let's say you want to be a beekeeper, which you could all be beekeepers, it's really easy to do. Um, so you decide you want to be a beekeeper. The best time to decide to be a beekeeper is in the fall. So you can start contacting other beekeepers and you could start reaching out to a bunch of other companies and say, hey, you know, I want to get started with bees. Can we talk about this a little bit? So what you're going to do is you're going to order a package of bees. It sounds crazy, but <laughs> you're going to order a package of bees in the mail. And I will show you what a package of bees looks like. You're going to order one of these things. So those are all bees that live inside this little box and it's going to come from Florida. Sorry, not from Florida, it's going to come from California. <laughs> So this is a one pound box of bees. You can get a one pound box of bees or a three pound box of bees. And this box of bees is gonna have all the females. There's gonna be no male bees in this one. And it's going to have one queen. And the queen is gonna be in a separate cage. And you're doing this because you don't want the worker bees to kill the queen. It sounds really ruthless and horrible. But if the bees are not, um, have not accepted their queen yet, they are gonna kill her, so you wanna make sure that the two became friends and they have accepted each other. So what you're gonna do is you have your hive. So you're gonna set up one of these fantastic hives. And this is the roof. So maybe I'll stand over here for a moment. So you would set up your hive. You have your roof. And then you have your inner cover. This is used for ventilation to make sure they have enough airflow and they can all breathe properly. And then in here, you're going to have a bunch of different frames. And these are going to be where the bees actually live. And this is almost the lungs of the hive, because they don't have their own lungs, um, where they're actually going to raise their young and store their honey and actually produce. Um, so what you're going to do is you're going to take that box that I was showing you. And you're going to take out their food storage, because they're coming from California. So they're making a huge truck over. So they need to have proper food storage. So in this photo, we're taking out the sugar water, which is used to keep them alive. Um, because the bees are going to come around Easter. And if you can all remember from this past Easter, we had snow on the ground. And I <laughs> remember the frantic phone call I got when they called me and said, the bees are in. I said, you've got to be kidding me. There's snow on the ground. How <laughs> are the bees here already? So I was, I was really worried that they were going to die because it was so cold. So we took out all the sugar water. And then we take out the queen. She's in this cage. She's completely covered because the bees are starting to accept her. So this cage is completely covered right now. And then after that, we're going to brush all those bees off. And we are going to put that cage with the queen in there inside the hive. So that's going to perfectly sit right in the center right here. So we're dealing with this amount of space right here. Then after that, and then this is, this is wild. We're going to throw the bees into the hive. Just take this box of bees and shake the box into this hive. And they don't all want to get out, so you have to proceed to knock the box on each side. 
which is always a really tricky situation to do. So you knock the bees on one side and throw them in, you knock them on the other side. Um, they will go, um, they, all, um, they all have um, a similar pheromone smell, so they will all be attracted to the same pheromone smell, and they will have, because they've been traveling with that one individual queen, they're going to be attracted <coughs> to that one individual queen. So if one bee is from a different spot or gets knocked somewhere else, it will automatically go into this hive to be with his other sisters. So they'll automatically go and start working together. So there's no real individuals in a hive, everyone works together as a perfect society. Um, so once you're done knocking all the bees, um, you can see right here, this comb right here, the bees are automatically going to produce comb no matter where they are. Um, they produce comb from having sugar water and they extrude it out of their abdominal. So it's this really crazy concept where they extrude this wax and they, they make these perfect hexagons. And then this makes this wonderful comb and this comb kind of acts as the lungs of the hive where they're going to put their babies in there, they're going to cap that over, they're going to have their nectar, and they're going to whip this nectar into honey. So they've already started making this comb, which they would start using as almost their life source, where they would put in all of their wonderful things. Um, so in this situation, you would take out those individual combs um, because it's not going to have the same consistency as this regular hive right here. So you're going to take that out. And after that, you're going to brush the bees around because you don't want to squish the bees. Um, as I showed you over here, there's not a lot of space gap between this inner cover and then the top cover. So you want to make sure, because you have this pile of bees, it's literally like this high. So you want to make sure the bees are not on top of each other so you don't squish them in there and then you kill half your hive that you're just newly installing. So then after that, yep, we're back to the center. So then after that, that's how you install your hives. Right there, when you first get started. Um, so then you would let your bees um, hang out and make sure that they're all getting accustomed with each other. And because we installed these bees around Easter when there was snow on the ground, there wasn't any nectar flow, so we had to supplement the bees with food. And there's a couple different sources of food that you can get. You can either get sugar water. Um, some people use high fructose corn syrup. Some people use honey from the previous season, so they won't actually eat all their honey, but they'll actually save their honey combs on these individual frames and they will save that for the bees so they'll actually give that to their bees so they can use this as a source for them to actually consume food uh, and survive. So once the nectar flow starts, um, and a good thing to know how the nectar flow is starting is when the dandelions start to pop up. That's how you can know that you can stop feeding your bees and they're going to be fine and they can start gathering all this wonderful nectar and produce that way. Um, they're really interesting. They can fly up to two miles in any direction to gather honey. So the bees that we have on campus actually pollinate a third of Eau Claire, which is quite a big amount of space. They can fly up to nine miles if they need food, but because there are wonderful plants in everyone's yards, they don't have to exceed that two miles. So once, so that's one way to get started with your hive. If you're lucky enough, you can get started with a swarm. <coughs> And this is a beekeeper's dream because you don't have to pay for a hive package. One of those hive packages that I showed you is about $80 per one of those. So if you're lucky enough to find a swarm, it's free bees, which is a wonderful thing to do. Um, we were fortunate enough to find a swarm. Actually, it was one of our hives that took off and it doubled. So we were able to exceed our size a little bit. So our bees took off and they flew up into this pine tree about 30 feet up in the air. So at one end, it's really exciting because you have a new hive, but at the same time, it's like, dang it, I have to go up 30 feet to gather this swarm and put them back in their box. Oh. So as you can see right here, I hope everyone can see that over here. This is a swarm right there. So this next image, my fantastic friend was sweet enough to climb 30 feet up in the tree to go and get the swarm. So the next thing, so you're up in this tree, and you say, oh, I have some new bees, but how am I gonna get the bees back into the hive? Um, my wonderful grandfather up in the front brought a saw, and we proceeded to cut the limb of this tree off, and we did so really carefully. So you can see right here, the bees are starting to bow down. Yes, he's right in the picture. Well, both of them are. <laughs> both of them are. So, <laughs> so we're cutting this limb, 
and I'm underneath the tree with a swarm capturing tool, which is just a simple box. And this sounds absolutely insane. I completely understand. You're standing underneath this tree with this box, <laughs> ready to catch these bees. It sounds absolutely insane. Um, so we cut the limb, and the bees fall down to the ground. And after that, we tried to scoop all of these bees into this box, um, which they didn't perfectly fall into the box, so we have to shake this limb of bees into this box. Um, and then after doing that, we continue to shake and shake and shake and try to get all the bees in there. Because the key is, if you can get the queen to fall into that box, you have a hive. If the queen is not in the box, you have to do the whole process again. How do you know if the queen's in the box? So, all bees kind of look alike. they do all look alike, yeah. which is really complicated, especially in that situation where you have bees on this tree and they're in this box and they're everywhere and they're flying. What you do is you just put the box on the ground and you just stare at it for five minutes. And if the bees are in the box, you know that the queen is there. So then you would just seal up the box and you would let them relax and then you throw them back into the hive. That's all you do. Yes? Doesn't the rest of the bees move out of the way of the queen? She's walking yes. Her, she has this little aura around her where there's just a little bit of space. Yes. Allows you to find the queen yes. Her. yes, absolutely. And you can even um, put a marker on her. You can put a little dot on her head. And a lot of beekeepers will um, do these markers um, according to different years. Mm -hmm. So they'll have, I forget uh, which ones are for which year, but there's a white one, a red one, a blue one, and a green one. And so if you get it to a really large scale um, and you're going through your hives very quickly, you want to see how old the queen is and if they create a new queen or if you have a queen that's four years old. So they usually average about four years old. Um, then, they, um, then they die. But um, yep, that's definitely one way. Yes? When do bees, is there a certain time that bees will swarm? Yes, there is a swarm season. So the swarm season is early enough in the year so the bees know they can actually create a new hive without perishing in the winter. So we're past swarm season now. So swarm season is about a month in June. Um, and there's a lot of warning signs for swarm season, um, which are really hard to tell until you've really seen the swarm signs. Um, but I've had some, I've met some wonderful beekeepers who have you know, shown me things to look for with swarm season. I, a really um, close key to know you have swarm season is you're going to find these queen cells that are going to be hanging outside of your frames if you're using the system of beekeeping. So if you do want your bees to swarm, you would keep all of these individual cells. If you don't want them to swarm, you would take all of these queen cells off. And you could either start your own hive from these queen cells, or you could just remove them and if you don't want them to swarm on you. So that's definitely a way you could do that. Yep. OK, so this whole swarm process, you know, and there's guys over in this tree and there's some branches coming in with their chainsaw or whatever. Slicing it off. Um, it's, it's, a, uh, it's about a day. Um, oh, okay. I had a really good friend of mine who's also a beekeeper, and he was saying that he found a rogue swarm. And he said it was the craziest thing because he had this window of opportunity about an hour where he knew they weren't going to swarm in an hour, so he ran home quickly to get a box and to get a couple other supplies make sure he was covered. And by the time he got back, he heard this rumbling of a buzz, this mass of buzzing. And they almost took off like an angry cloud, and they just took off. And they can fly up to 20 miles an hour, so you can't really outrun them. Right. So if they go, they're gone. Wow. And if you're lucky enough to get into a car and follow them, you can. It's almost like this big, angry cloud that just is flowing. But they're not angry at all. They're just lost and confused, and they're trying to find something. But it's actually to a point where if you find a swarm, you can actually stick your hand inside the swarm, and they won't sting you, because they're not guarding any honey and they're just trying to find a new house. So they're like, hey, you know a good place to live? Do you know a good place to live? So they're just trying to feel things out. But if you were to open up one of these, the bees are going to be mad because you're coming in like a robber and you're stealing all their prized possessions. So they're going to be a little upset with you. But if they're just hanging out on a tree limb, you could, even if you had a big purse, you could, <laughs> this sounds insane too, but you could almost just slice the bees off with a credit card and just slide them off and put them into your purse seal your purse and walk away, because they're not going to sting you. So sounds a little insane. But that's actually the safest forms of bees that you can find. Um, yep, so here's the bees in the box. And yep, and just trying to see if I could find the queen, but I couldn't find her, but we knew she was in there. 
Okay, so you started your hive either through a swarm or through an installation. Okay, so then you're thinking, all right, how do I take care of these bees and how do I manipulate their environment so they don't take off on me, either through a swarm or either through um, making sure there's enough ventilation in there, uh, making sure you're creating this perfect environment for them. So this next section we have here is more of the maintenance. So the most important thing you want to do while taking care of your bees is use smoke. If you don't use smoke, you will definitely get stung. Yes? How come everyone uses smoke? Just out of curiosity, as well as I'm a beekeeper. Oh, you are? Oh, you have it? Oh, you're so lucky. Oh, you're so lucky. Wow, so that's fantastic. Does. That could be it too. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I say there's got to be something different about my hives than other people's hives. It's that you have to do those things to really maintain a hive. There's many different theories. There's so many different theories on why you smoke bees. And I've met um, another good friend of mine doesn't hardly use any smoke, and if he does, he only smokes them a little bit. Um, and there's so many different schools of thought on this. Um, the most common theory I've heard about why you smoke bees is a lot of um, the native bees would have their hives inside empty logs and there would, would constantly be a lot of forest fires. So anytime there'd be a forest fire, this was almost a signal to a lot of the bees to, hey, you know, like go inside your hive and hang out and this will pass. So it, it's almost the signal to... Yep. yep, and to gorge on the honey and to just really hang out and wait for everything. Make them zip out. <laughs> yeah. They're busy and they're doing this. Yep. There's, there, I've met a lot of other people who don't smoke at all, and then I've met people who smoke all the time. I try not to smoke for a very long time, but I realize that <coughs> if I didn't smoke the bees, I, my, on a personal level, I just got very uncomfortable, and I, my game would be thrown off, and I would mentally freak out, which the bees can sense that. And so uh, from a personal level, I personally really like to smoke the bees, and I like to have lots of garb on because um, it makes me feel more comfortable on a personal level while taking care of them. Because the bees can really sense it. If you are not comfortable and if you are not in the right mood to take care of the bees, you shouldn't be in your hive. Because um, the bees are going to leave you alone if you don't open the hive. But um, if you have all the proper procedures and if you're in the right state of mind, and I'm sure you're in the perfect state of mind to take care of bees, if you don't have to wear anything or have any smoke, <laughs> that's something to strive towards, absolutely. But I always put on I put on massive boots and massive garb, and I have so much smoke. And I do it from a personal level, um, and I always suggest to people to make sure you use lots of smoke while starting out, and you know, play by your own rules. If you don't want to smoke your bees, completely fantastic. Um, from a personal level, I do like to smoke the bees, though. Um, so I just have a couple images of having a good amount of smoke here. If you can see, I know I'm in a really bad spot over here. Um, over here. Um, Yep, some people don't prefer to use gloves, some people do. It all gets down to, uh, if you personally feel comfortable not wearing gloves, you don't have to. Um, some people do prefer to wear gloves. Um, it just really comes down to your own personal, um, what makes you most comfortable. Um, and if you're really comfortable wearing a swimsuit and taking care of your bees, by all means, you should go do that. <laughs> and I've seen images of people doing that, and I think, oh my god, I couldn't do that. Um, so the first thing you want to do when you have your hive is you're going to take off your cover, um, and then you're going to give lots of smoke or not smoke, it's up to you, whatever you want to do. Um, and then after that, you're going to look for um, healthy patches of bees, um, and just make sure that they are together, because a lot of taking care of bees is really just observing them in and out of the hive and making sure that you have healthy amounts of bees coming in and out of your hive. Um, it's a good rule of thumb. If you can count the amount of bees coming into your hive, 
you have a good hive. If you can't count the amount of bees coming into your hive, you have a good hive. If you can count on your hand how many bees are entering and exiting, your hive isn't doing too well, and there might be something going on, whether that's something that's connected to <coughs> their environment, whether that's something connected to uh, varroa mites, something else that might be going on. So it's, it's a good thing to just kind of observe what's going on outside so the hive. You're before. saying you should actually open it up several times during the summer? Oh yeah, absolutely. Because if you're during swarm season, you want to make sure you have no queen cells. Um, you want to make sure you don't have varroa mites. Um, there are other couple diseases that can occur because um, bees' immune system is really, really low, and there's so many bees that are living in a very small sp um, space. So you want to make sure that these bees are ultra healthy um, because if one gets sick, they're all going to get sick. Um, and oftentimes they can recover from these different things, but it's also really important to know what's going on with your individual hive. And just to kind of have some good warning signs so you can be aware of different treatments to use. Um, there's many different things you can do. You can use chemicals on your hives if you want. Um, from a personal level, I don't like to use those chemicals. Um, if I have varroa mites, I like to use powdered sugar that I would put on um, the hives because they're going to be a little bit more conscious about, sorry, cautious about cleaning each other a little bit more. So they're going to pick off these individual varroa mites. But like I said, it's completely up to whatever you'd like to do. Um, but I think just having proper exposure to all the different systems that you can have and then to come to your own conclusion of how you personally want to take care of your bees and have your own philosophy for taking care of your bees. Um, so another good thing to do is you want to take out all these individual frames and they're going to use propolis, which is almost like a bee glue. And right now these are really easy to move in and out, but I have almost broken multiple frames because the propolis is so thick. Um, or have almost snapped hives in half. As you can see here, these um, are not straight cut to each other. They have more um, of tooth cut here. So this is not gonna be as easy to break. Um, when I first got into building hives, I didn't build them like this. So I would snap apart these hives because the propolis is so thick and they're just sealing this so much. So you wanna make sure that the bees have a lot of propolis going on and you know they're gonna be healthy. Um, there's many different tools you can use. In this individual photo, um, I have a hive tool that you can, I didn't bring it with me today, but you can actually pick up these individual uh, frames, or you can use tools like this one, or you can use brushes over here. Um, and then, of course, here's the smoker right here. So there's many different ways you can um, open up your hives. Um, that's just one form. Um, here's just another image of just like taking out the individual frames. You want to make sure that you're going through really slow motions the bees will get upset because there's so many going on in each individual hive. Um, and then here is we are taking apart these um, hives and we're just kind of looking at are these uh, individual frames, are they full of capped honey, are they full of brood? Uh, and this one happens to be full of honey right here. And then the honey storage is going to be more on the outside. Um, as you can see here, this is the bees are just starting to form all of their wax. And they're going to do so in this beautiful pattern right here. So as you can see here, this is completely empty. So this has no comb on it. Um, and here, the comb is starting to, as you can kind of see, and I, want, and I would encourage everyone to come up and play with these different things in a little bit. Um, they're starting to form this wax on the sides. And in here, they're starting to form it as well. As you can see a little bit right, I'll just dip down a little bit right here. They're starting to cap that over. There we go. Oh, and there's another thing you want to do is you just want to see, um, are they, is the queen properly laying? If your queen is properly laying, you're going to have a healthy hive. If she's not properly laying, you're going to have to requeen. Um, I've had to requeen multiple times, and I'm sure you have as well, um, just to make sure that she's really healthy and laying properly. All right. Let's see here. Try to get out of here. All right, um, and this right here is an image of a very healthy brood pattern. Um, and this, you can see that the queen is laying in a really, really healthy way, and that she's laying in an order um, where she's not getting confused. Um, and this just means that there's going to be a lot of more bees that are going to come out. Um, a bee's lifespan in the summer is um, minimum um, three months in the winter, and then um, up to three weeks in the summer because they're literally working themselves to death. They're just flying everywhere up to two miles um, in any direction, any given time. So, so that's maintenance. 
So you're going to do this throughout the entire year. Um, and then we get to the absolute fun part of beekeeping, which is probably my favorite, is the harvest. I know it's a lot of other people's favorite thing too. So in this image, you want to look for a frame that is completely solid of capped honey. And then what you're going to do is you are going to slice off the outer layer of the wax. And you are going to slice this off so you can actually, if you're going to use a centrifuge, um, which is most common with this form of beekeeping, so you want to ex extract all of the honey from these frames without destroying the wax because you're going to create more work for your bees in the end. So you want to create an environment so you can have the bees create the most honey that they possibly can and less wax. Um, this is an absolutely fantastic photo because this is looking at the different types of foraging that the bees are going to do. The lighter honey is going to be more of your spring flow, early summer flow, where the darker honey is going to have more of the influence um, of your fall flowers. Um, I think this has more of the influence of the clover honey, so it's going to have that darker complexion to it, and it's really fantastic. You can do multiple harvests throughout a year, um, and you can do a harvest uh, in the spring, and you're going to have um, almost this very, very light color, and it's going to be super fluid. Or you can even um, harvest from even in up till late September, early October, and you're going to have more of a buckwheat influence depending on where you are. I have other examples of tupelo honey. So tupelo honey is an example um, of honey from Florida where people are going to put their hives on the tupelo blossom. And then after tupelo blossom is done, they're going to extract all that honey and it's going to be tupelo honey. So it's just going to be from that one variety versus more of a general honey. So this is more of a general honey that's from more of a regional area and not so much from an individual flower and in that um, one flower, but more of a encompassing from an entire area. So after you begin to slice up, oh, here's another fantastic example of comb and honey that you can also do. So you can do another system if you're using this one. So you will actually have the comb and the honey together. You'll pop this out. This is a plastic form that you can do. I would not suggest doing a plastic form. I would suggest doing one um, where the bees, um, where you can reuse it. Because with this one, I don't think the bees are really happy with this one, depending on where I was. Um, and I like using more of this model from a personal standpoint because then you can reuse this one, where this one, it was a one-time use, and I just felt like it wasn't very sustainable, so we stopped using that form. Um, so you're going to take a knife, and you're going to slice off all of the capped honey here, and you're going to continue to slice this all. It's kind of go down a little bit. Slice this all off. So right here near the bottom, this is all sliced off. Near the top, it's not. Yep. So you would set up for a harvest. So you would um, say, hey, we're going to harvest today. So you would smoke the bees. You would take all of your frames out, and then you would set up, and you would extract all of this honey. So you're going to remove all the outer spots of it. And then after that, you're going to put it inside a um, extractor, and you're going to whip the honey from each individual cell outside of that cell without destroying this very fragile wax. Um, if you want, you could just cut out these individual combs if you wanted. Um, and upon doing so, you would have comb and honey, which is one form to do that. Or if you actually want to have this without the comb and honey, without the wax, you could just whip it out. Um, so a lot of beekeepers in this area are going to use the, um, this form, and they're actually going to whip out the honey. But there are different forms you can use where you can have the comb and honey. So there's just a couple different versions. Um, oh, here's a different tool you can use. If your honey is not um, exceeding this wood part right here, you can use a little scraper tool. And the scraper tool is going to do this, uh, essentially the same job as the knife, where you're actually going to break the seal, because you need the seal to be broken to actually whip out the honey. All right, so here is the um, extractor. Um, I have a four... Um, frame extractor. Um, and this was a hand-pumped one. You can get them, so they're actually pumped by a machine. Uh, depending on your size of your apiary, um, there are some people who have up to 5,000 hives. They're going to have all electric extractors, and some people are going to have one hive. So it just kind of depends on the different size, um, and you would get your equipment depending on your different size apiary that you're going to have. Um, 
and you want to make sure that you don't whip this too hard or you're going to have an issue because this wax is so fragile that you're actually going to break it and it's going to stick to the ends of your extractor, which I have done countless times. <laughs> countless times. Um, and then here's a really fantastic part where the honey starts to come out really slowly out of the end. Um, and then here it's just absolutely pouring out. And with this system, you can choose to A, do an ex uh, a filter system or not to do a filter system. Um, we use a very, very coarse filter because we want to separate the wax from the honey. And we do this just because I really like tea and I don't like having the wax on the edge of my cups. <laughs> so from a personal standpoint, I do like to filter the honey. But by all means, if you like the comb and the wax and everything mixed together, you can absolutely not have to filter your honey. Um, and then here's just a couple different images here. And then this next photo is really exciting. Here's just a different color from doing more of an early um, extraction versus a later one. So, and then you have a big old bucket. There you go. And we have a couple of bees that, you know, got excited and gorged a little bit too much and drowned in the process. But <laughs> you got to be careful you don't do that. Um, yeah, so that is a lot of the, so that essentially is the process. Um, the photos that I don't have on here, um, which we're in the process of gathering, would be um, overwintering. Um, so the act of taking this whole hive apart. So when you go to harvest, you're going to take your entire hive apart, and you're going to end up with two of these boxes sitting on top of each other. When you go into the winter, you're going to make sure that these hives are sealed, but still have enough ventilation, um, so they can make it through the winter. Because bees don't have little towels, so they can't dry themselves. So you've got to make sure that there's enough airflow so they don't drown in the winter. So um, soon I hope to have um, a bunch of photos of the overwintering process um, and then also breaking up with the spring. So that's just a couple photos of that one. So I have a question for you. You hmm? said, okay, let's say you have five hives. Yep, five okay. hives, yep. And then you're only going to keep the bottom two showing? Yes. So the bees will all be in there? They'll all be in there. Yep. So what you're going to do is the first two boxes, if you use the system, are going to be all the bees. So this is where they're going to have all their babies, they're going to have all of their honey, they're going to have all of their pollen, their whole community is going to be in here. The additional boxes, or as beekeepers like to call them, supers, you can do deep supers, you can do small supers, um, and they can be different um, sizes. So they can be as, as skinny as this, or as big as this one, and it's all going to be surplus honey. So all of the honey that you would extract would be the surplus honey. You're not going to touch any of the bees' honey. Um, because they might not make it through the winter. So you just leave them out from year to year? That's yes, it's in, it's in there. Yep. Extracted. And it's all mixed in, so you're going to have babies mixed in with food sources. Right. So okay. even if you extracted it, you would have bee larvas right. mixed in with honey. It just becomes this messy yeah. ordeal, so it's okay. better to leave these two alone. Right. And let that be the bees. So then you're going to go into winter with this. Um, and that's essentially how you take care of bees, um, just from a, a basic standpoint. So it's just trying to keep them in here. Um, the next thing I would like to show everybody um, is some of um, <coughs> some research that I've been working on, which I'm really, really excited about. Uh, this is a map of all the different apiaries um, that I have been able to find in Wisconsin. So I came up with a survey and I sent it to a bunch of beekeepers and I said, hey, can you fill out the survey? I would really like to start documenting where bees are in Wisconsin. Um, and I convinced 61 beekeepers <laughs> to take the survey, um, and we were able to map them. Um, so you can click on any of these, and you can actually see the apiary information from 2012. This is going to have how, mon how many pounds that they um, yield, how many gallons that they yield, what is the average per hive based on how many hives they have, um, what type of hive system do they have, what kind of bees do they have. There's so many different varieties of bees. There's up to 5,000 varieties of bees in the world. Um, the two most common types in this region are Canorlian and Italian, so the majority of people are going to have that. Um, and then this is also documentation of that. As you scroll down a little bit more, um, just kind of looking at how do they, um, what do they consider their environment to be, whether it's rural, urban, suburban, um, and what kind of pests did they have in 2011, um, and did they have a swarm loss where the bees actually took off on them, or did they have an overwinter loss, or did they have dead queens? And at the bottom, there's actually a pie chart where you can, whoop, let's not do that. Oh, no. 
Let's see here, what did I do here? Uh-oh. Oh, it looks like it's still working. Uh, hmm. Go back to the right. Okay, um, and at the bottom, there is actually a pie chart where you can see what their losses are gonna be. So the amount of highs that they have, and there's gonna be a breakdown by, did they have a swarm loss? or did they have dead queens? Um, and I'm really excited about this because this is really showcasing more of a geospatial um, way of looking at your individual hives. Um, a lot of research has been done on colony collapse disorder. Um, this really interesting phenomenon that it started occurring in 2005. Um, David Hackenberg was a, more the poster child of this. He lost 2,000 hives in a single month, which is absolutely insane. Um, so a lot of research has been done looking at different soil types, looking at different um, diseases, looking at the influence of monoculture, looking at the influence of fungicides, neonicotinoids. Um, but I haven't really seen anything from a spatial standpoint that really just documents and says, hey, this is where beekeepers are. Um, so I'm really hoping to expand this a little bit and to look at more of the human environmental interactions. And just to say, hey, is this beekeeper in this area close to mine having the same problem that I'm having? Are they having swarm losses at the same rate that I'm having? Are they having dead queens? Um, and if so, are they having the same type of pest problems? If this is going to be infestation of mice, are they having mice problems too? Are they having varroa mites? Um, so I'm hoping to kind of expand this a little bit and send out this map and this website again um, to a bunch of beekeepers so I can expand this more and hopefully be able to spread it to more of the urban environments and really kind of tell the story of bees and their influence in urban environments. So that's what I have for you guys today. Um, I would encourage everyone to come up and sample different honey or look at all these fantastic books or put on the individual um, bee garbs, which are really fun to put on. I really like wearing them. Um, or if anyone has any questions to, yeah. How do you keep the, you said there could be a mic issue. Yep. How do you keep them from getting into the hives? They get into the hives. What do you do? Um, so this is really interesting. It was overwinter. Yep. I've had a couple of mice infestations, and it's because the bees either actually had a swarm in January, which is wild, because we had a really, um, it was really, really warm in January, so the bees thought, oh my gosh, it's spring, this is fantastic, and they took off, which is absolutely unheard of. Um, so then after they took off, mice came in, and they actually started um, infesting the hive. Um, if you do have a mice infestation, I have heard really bizarre stories where mice have actually come in and beekeepers have actually opened up their hives and they've seen mummified mice because the bees will sting the mouse to death. Then after that, because the bees weigh so little, they can't actually pick up the mouse. What they will do is they will take wax and they'll actually mummify these mice inside these hives, which is absolutely just bizarre. So anytime there's gonna be infestation that's gonna weigh more than the bee, because um, the bees will actually pick up each other, but they can't exceed that um, weight. They'll actually mummify anything that comes in here um, which is really, and I've seen some really interesting photos of this, and okay. on a personal level, I'd really like to see what that looks like. But at the same time, I don't really want to deal with it. So I don't really know how I feel about that. Like, oh, but, so that's something that you can do. Um, a lot of other beekeepers will have issues with bears, so you'll have to put up um, electric fences. So I have a, uh, we just started up an apiary um, by Oliva, so we, it was our first time playing around with an electric fence. Make sure it's off, make sure it's off. <laughs> a good thing to know. Um, but yeah, there's um, many different things you can do with this, but... Um, when you have the mice, do you have to take everything out and just start, I mean, just destroy everything, really, and start over, right? Yep, so if in a mice situation, yeah. which I've had, um, which I actually didn't realize I had a mice infestation until we were about to install the hives, which is in our set of problems, what you have to do is you have to deconstruct your hive, and you have to actually take out all your wax inserts, um, and then you can just put in more wax inserts that you can get. Don't use the old ones. Don't. You could use the wood oh. here, but you can get wax inserts. Or if you actually take out this wax insert, it's called a wura hive. So the bees would just bow down and just make beautiful comb. This system is uh, called the movable frame Langstroth system. is the most common system for beekeepers because it's human friendly, not necessarily bee friendly. So this is the best system for people to take honey. So if you were to have a top bar system, which is also a very popular system to do, um, I don't know if you can all see this, but there's a little baby top bar, top bar frame up in this corner that can pass this around too. 
Um, and this is going to more imitate how bees are going to live in the natural environment. And this is almost going to be more like a log system. And the bees are actually going to make this beautiful um, comb that's just going to drip down. It almost looks like teardrops. It's absolutely gorgeous. Um, and they're going to make this. And sometimes in situations, they will almost make these waves with honey, uh, which is really complicated to harvest. So it makes it really hard. Um, and oftentimes, if you wanted to extract this type of honey, it would end up killing your entire hive because you wouldn't find the queen. You would kill off half of your brood. You would kill off all your drones. And you would destroy the entire hive. Um, there's other situations um, where people would actually just take that entire hive out and then they would crush it and they would extract all that honey. So then you're out of hive. So especially with all the declining bee populations, it's not really cost effective to really do this to your hive. So this system is really, really popular. But um, there definitely are still top bar systems and this has been more of a grassroots push for more of a natural form of bee This program was recorded and presented by Chippewa Valley Community Television. Chippewa Valley Community Television is made possible by continuing community support. If you would like to volunteer or make a donation, you can contact us by calling 715-839-5067 or on the web at www.cbctv.org.